Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and this talk is going to be on the GI tract and its involvement by lymphoma. It's interesting, we kind of speak about various organs with lymphoma in different sections, like the stomach, the small bowel, the mediastinum, the kidneys, the pancreas, the liver. But recently, I've had a number of cases of primary small bowel lymphoma, or primary gastric lymphoma, and even primary colon lymphoma, which got me to thinking about the various appearances and how some things are classic, how some things overlap, but I thought it'd be a good talk to share with you. So let's look at a few facts first. This article by Giuseppe La Ray, risk factors implicated in the pathogenesis of GI lymphoma are some infections due to H. pylori, human immunodeficiency virus infection, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, Hep B, uh, T cell, and some other things including celiac disease, IBD, and parasite infections. We talk about some of the radiology features of lymphoma. The clinical presentation is really not specific. Sometimes it's low-grade fever, sometimes it's weight loss, sometimes it's epigastric pain, but it's very variable. It's really not specific to say, oh, you must have lymphoma. And again, depending when in the spectrum people present, the size of the tumors can be small or they can be large. Sometimes patients present, though uncommonly, with bowel obstruction. Sometimes patients present with GI bleeding. Now, when you look at some numbers, GI lymphoma accounts for up to 20% of extranodal lymphomas. The stomach is the most common site, followed by the small bowel. And when you have small bowel involvement, it's more common distally. Remember, we always would say adenocarcinoma is more common duodenum, and lymphoma more common in the ileum, and that's indeed the case. We also talk about colorectal lymphoma. We tend not to think about the colon uh, with anything more than infection or tumors like colon cancer, but lymphoma is a possibility. GI lymphomas most commonly occur around the sixth decade of life, and although rare in childhood, they are the most common GI tumors in this age population. The majority of GI lymphomas are of B-cell origin, while up to 10% would show a T-cell origin. Most low-grade B-cell lymphomas are mucosal-associated lymphoid tissue types, malt lymphoma, while enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma is the most common primary GI T-cell lymphoma. GI lymphomas represent a heterogeneous group of entities originating from different cell lineage. One of the most common ones I seem to see, particularly when it's bulky, will end up being B-cell lymphoma, but the pathology will vary, and in some sense, the pathology will define in part treatment, but also in part outcome. In terms of technique, if you're looking at bowel pathology in general, you'll do CT enterography, and obviously, whether it's adenocarcinoma or some infectious disease or lymphoma, CT enterography is very good. When we look at the patient for small bowel or stomach or colon lymphoma, we also, of course, look at the presence of adenopathy and the spread of disease. A CT, of course, is very good. Think chest, abdomen, pelvis for staging lymphoma. PET CT is also very good, uh, though the terms of how much additional information comes from the PET CT compared to a regular CT might be more potentially on some of the information that's used for therapy planning, but both of those studies work very well. CT, of course, tends to be the study where the initial diagnosis is made, and PET-CT is often when you're trying to get a more complete staging. Now, when I talk about uh, GI tract lymphoma, I typically talk about stomach, small bowel, and colon, with my big emphasis being on small bowel, and that's probably where we see the most cases. But it also should be commented that primary esophageal lymphomas are uncommon. They usually result from lymph node metastasis of lymphoma from the cervical and mediastinal region and involve the esophagus secondarily. You're typically not going to pick up 
a esophageal mass and say, what is it? Because they're typically going to see other nodes in the neck or in the mediastinum. There is a challenge at times separating esophageal cancer from esophageal lymphoma, but usually it's the fact that with lymphoma, again, the bulky adenopathy with esophageal cancer, there can be small nodes present, but typically it's tumor infiltration. And I'm going to not bother showing you any examples of that at this time. I am going to do another talk on the, the esophagus, and we'll have some cases at that point. So let's start with the stomach. It used to be said that um, it was easy to separate gastric lymphoma from adenocarcinoma because lymphoma typically had a wall thickness of over 5 centimeters, gastric adenocarcinoma under 3 centimeters, lymphoma had bulkier nodes and nodes that extended beneath the hilum of the kidney, while adenocarcinoma the nodes weren't as bulky and were above the hilum of the kidney, but that's not always the case. You're more likely to get carcinomatosis, of course, as well as Krugenberg tumors with adenocarcinoma as opposed to lymphoma, where ascites, particularly early on, is less common. But again, bulky adenopathy can be very, very helpful. It's interesting, as we commented, the classic description of lymphoma doesn't hold true as much today because often the lesions are small, malt lymphomas tend to be infiltrating commonly in the antrum and look very close to adenocarcinoma. Particularly since we do CT earlier these days, the bulky adenopathy may not be present, so you may have an infiltrating tumor in the stomach. We are pretty sure it's malignancy, but you're not really sure whether it's an adenocarcinoma or lymphoma. And in many cases, you assume it's just an adenocarcinoma, and then on biopsy, it ends up being lymphoma. So again, there is going to be some overlap. Some of the key findings we mentioned, wall thickening. Lymphoma tends not to have significant enhancement. The truth is adenocarcinoma doesn't either. Things like carcinoid tumors of the stomach are more likely or metastasis to be more vascular. With lymphoma, it can be diffuse or segmental. And particularly when it's not very bulky, it can be difficult to distinguish from adenocarcinoma or scirrhous carcinoma. You can also see polypoid masses or multiple masses. And again, the presence of adenopathy, particularly bulky adenopathy, pushes you toward the diagnosis of lymphoma. Here's a classic case of a patient with abdominal pain, very large, bulky tumor, diffuse infiltration. It doesn't have the look of a gist tumor, which is usually eccentric. It doesn't have the look of a classic adenocarcinoma, it doesn't have the look of metastatic disease. When something looks this bulky, even though there's minimal adenopathy present, this is going to be the classic case, really nicely shown in the sagittal view here, of a large gastric B-cell lymphoma a very, very classic diagnosis. In fact, this tumor is so large that when you look very quickly, you think about stomach, but you wonder, could this be arising from the small bowel simply pushing against the stomach? The sagittal image probably best shows you how the tumor really infiltrates. Um, so it's a little bit of a better example. Just a very nice B-cell lymphoma. Another case, this case is an infiltrating tumor in the antrum of the stomach. I would have suspected, and I did suspect it was an adenocarcinoma. There's no significant adenopathy. There's infiltration present uh, on biopsy. This was B-cell lymphoma. So it's a nice example of the point I made that there's an infiltrating process which looks all the world like an adenocarcinoma, but ended up being a B-cell lymphoma. Another example, malt lymphoma. Look at the antrum of the stomach. You can see the tumor infiltrating. Again, adenocarcinoma is a thought. This patient had HIV. I don't see an anopathy. There's a lesion in the liver, but that's a hemangioma. And this ended up being a malt lymphoma. And malt lymphomas or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue is a low grade lymphoma, commonly associated with H. pylori infection. And the most frequent CT finding is wall thickening, which can be relatively minimal in nature. And again, malt lymphomas are probably the ones that are most likely to be confused with gastric adenocarcinoma. Another example, patient with GI bleed. I don't see the act of bleeding, 
but I see in the fundus in the body, the stomach is markedly thickened compared to the antrum. Though there's some antral involvement, there's some mottled material in the stomach, and this was also gastric lymphoma, again, also nicely shown on the coronal view. Now, when we get to the small bowel, it's probably the most common place that we see lymphoma in practice. Risk factors, we mentioned AIDS, IBD, immunosuppression, particularly after solid organ transplants, lupus, Epstein-Barr virus are all things that are considered as additional risk factors for small bowel lymphoma. Like the stomach, they're typically B-cell origin. They're more common distally in the ileum because of increased lymphoid tissue. And the presentations of lymphoma, and this goes back to the uh, upper GI series, small bowel follow-through days, infiltrating lesions, aneurysmal dilatation, nodular filling defects, single or multiple, and endoexenteric form with fistula, particularly more common in the aggressive bulky lesions. Now, as we commented on, CT is very good both for staging and for follow-up. If I'm doing a case of suspected or follow-up lymphoma, you can use positive contrast, and I would use that if I'm worrying about a fistula, but I'm not worried about a fistula. I'll do CT enterography using a neutral contrast agent, probably water. That will help show me the tumor infiltration and extent, but again, positive contrast works well. You want to look very careful with lymphoma. Usually it's one bulky mass or one site of disease, but in other cases it can be multiple sites of disease. So you want to look very carefully at that. At times the masses are very large and it's very clear cut to you it's a malignancy and likely lymphoma. But you know, there's a range of things from inflammatory disease to other neoplastic diseases, including METs that can be very similar. Primary adenocarcinoma, METs especially from melanoma, and intestinal sarcoma can all be somewhat challenging. Crohn's disease or other infectious etiologies usually are easier because we can see the long segment of involvement. The appearance is typically different. Submucosal fat, particularly in patients with long-standing Crohn's disease, makes it a little bit easier. In terms of adenopathy, we can see nodes with things like Crohn's disease or TB, but the nodes usually aren't as bulky as they are in patients with um, primary lymphoma. Now, in terms of patterns, we talk about polypoid and infiltrative as two of the patterns of GI lymphoma. With polypoid, it can be a solitary nodule or it can be multiple nodules. When you think about polypoid lesions, you think about intersusceptions. With an infiltrative form, Again, it can be confusing with carcinoma or potentially inflammatory disease. With infiltrating forms, occasionally you can have obstruction of bowel, but in our experience, bowel obstruction with lymphoma is relatively rare, even in the cases with very large bulky disease. It tends to extend and grow exophytically and around the bowel wall, but the lumen tends to remain patent. So it's kind of interesting. There's um, extensive tumor and diffuse infiltration, but not the obstruction that you typically would associate and see in patients with adenocarcinoma. The aneurysmal pattern, the diameter of dilatation of the lumen over four centimeters, uh, is not uncommon. It's usually coexisting with the infiltrative form. Several factors are responsible for the aneurysmal dilatation. And no, I did not spell aneurysmal incorrectly. That's the English uh, spelling of that. You have progressive destruction of the myenteric plexus, muscle layers with stretching of muscle fibers, and the loss of contractile scans. On the other hand, the infiltration of arterial and lymphatic vessels determines anorexia and necrosis within the lesion. And according to some authors, this tumor necrosis can lead to cavitation and be responsible for the aneurysmal dilatation. So you can get some very aggressive tumors. Now, I just wanted to make the point and show you this case. And this case is an adenocarcinoma. There's also, oh, by the way, a lipoma in the duodenum. Bowel's not obstructed, but look at this four centimeter of wall thickening in the small bowel. You can see it very nicely there in the coronal.
on the axial. And I could think about lymphoma in this case. You could think about Crohn's disease, but it's a little bit too bulky and too focal for me for Crohn's disease. There's also no submucosal fat or any of the other findings I might associate with Crohn's disease. But lymphoma would be a good thought. This was biopsy and it ended up, here it is on cinematic, being adenocarcinoma. So I show this case to make the point that at times we do a great job finding the tumor. At the end of the day, we like to be more accurate saying adenocea or lymphoma, though we all know that the patient is not gonna be treated with chemotherapy unless they have pathology. So pathology is the final say, and there is a lot of overlap as nicely shown on these CR images. So very, very nice case. Now lymphoma. Here's an example of bulky infiltration of the fourth portion of duodenum and jejunum. There's ulceration present, there's adenopathy in the mesentery, there's ascites present. You can see the tumor has bulky adenopathy, which grows posteriorly to encase the celiac axis. You might have looked at this case and say, how do I know it's not pancreatic cancer? Maybe there's a tumor of the body growing posteriorly involving vessels. That is a good point and it's something to think about, but it does show you a case like this about how impressive the adenopathy is, but it's this image that gives me the diagnosis of small bowel lymphoma. This is just more for extent of disease, bulky tumor, but if I only looked at that bulkiness of the lymphomatous infiltration of the nodes, I would surely think about pancreatic cancer in my differential diagnosis. Now I mentioned a lot of times tumors are bulky, but they don't obstruct. Here's an example of a patient presenting with bowel obstruction. You see the markedly dilated bowel loops. You follow it downward. You follow it down all the way to the terminal ileum near the ileocecal valve, and you see a mass present there. Very nicely shown. Here it is in the coronal view where you can see the mass going from the patient's terminal ileum into the cecum. When there's a lesion that involves ileum and cecum, it's typically not going to be adenocarcinoma. It's typically going to be lymphoma. Again, we said lymphoma often does not obstruct, but in this case, obviously, it does obstruct the patient's small bowel. A very, very nice example of that. Now, one of the other things with lymphoma is that you can have multiple other organs involved. This was an interesting case of a patient with chest pain, and you see this large infiltrating tumor involving the left and right atrium. You can consider angiosarcoma, but lymphoma is also a good thought. When you look at the extent of that, pretty impressive. Then you go in the abdomen, and in the distal small bowel, there's an ulcerating small bowel lesion. This is a beautiful example of aneurysmal dilatation with ulceration, and it's lymphoma of the patient's bowel. Here it is nicely on the volume rendered images. Bulky tumor, ulceration, involvement of the heart. You can see involvement of liver and pancreas and spleen and kidneys. Again, a really nice example of lymphoma. Another case, we talk about spread of disease. This is the classic sandwich sign. This mass encasing the vessels in the mesentery, that's lymphoma. And look how it extends down along the mesenteric vessels, also involving small bowel. It's a large infiltrating tumor. That's a very, very nice example of small bowel lymphoma. And here's that same case with cinematic rendering, the encasement of the vessels, the cinematic sandwich sign, and again, diffuse infiltration around the vessels into the mesentery and involving small bowel with some very mild small bowel dilatation. Now, there are a lot of other things in the small bowel, and I wanna show you some more examples, but let's do this. Let's stop here and then come back and discuss some more examples. Be right back. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.